Good evening all. Um, today we have uh, a special under the spotlight uh, session with uh, Marta Bustillo. I, I hope I pronounce it uh, all right. Yes. Uh, she, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> she is a digital learning uh, librarian at the uh, University College in uh, Dublin. And she is one of the first most active and maybe most enthusiastic members of the NOL. <laughs> And uh, I give you the floor to hear more from you about your uh, open education travels. Okay, Monique, thank you so much. I'm just going to share my screen so that I can start my presentation. Okay, can you see that properly? Excellent. Mm -hmm. So I have call this presentation a journey of discovery and uh, the first thing I want to say is that this is not a journey that has finished by any means mm -hmm. so it is an ongoing journey and a lot to learn still um, so just to introduce myself I am I'm the digital learning librarian at University College Dublin I have been living in Ireland for a very long time um, but I wasn't always here. I am originally from Bilbao. So I moved from Bilbao on the left to Dublin on the right many, many, many moons ago from a river city to another river city. And as I have had said to me before very often, there is no way that a Basque person will feel a stranger in Ireland. <laughs> and that is completely true. Uh, very similar climates, very similar kind of uh, population. So naively, I came to Ireland. Initially, I thought for nine months to learn English a very long time ago. <laughs> Ended up studying in Trinity College Library, sorry, in Trinity College, uh, and using the Trinity College Library, also known as the Jedi Archives. Uh, and I think this is where my love for libraries started. I was studying art history and history in Trinity College, but the place that kept drawing me again and again is this room, the old library in Trinity College. And I think it was just one of these situations where, yes, I loved art history, but the library was just where my interests were. So that's what happened in the end. I did my PhD in art history. And while I was doing my PhD in art history, I got working in an academic library. So, this is, as I say, a, a, a kind of reflection on a journey, on librarianship and all things open. So I started working in um, the Library of the Art College in Dublin, the National College of Art and Design. And when I first started, I was just a, a, a library assistant. Very quickly, I got involved with their slide library, does anybody remember slides in this place? <laughs> um, all of the art history and art lecturers were using slides to show their students the artworks that they were talking about. And I was there creating slides, photographing stuff and turning it into a slide and making it possible for them to show it to the students. And then of course, the digital revolution started People started digitizing material. Shockingly, Kodak stopped making slide projectors. <laughs> and so we had to create a project to create a digital slide library. And that was really where I started thinking about open things and eventually about, about open education because I was creating this digital library of images initially in an intranet for our own lecturers and students. Uh, but of course, we were having to buy some images from museums, 
digitize others that couldn't be found anywhere else. And I needed to learn a lot about copyright, about Creative Commons licensing, which was in its infancy at the time. And that was what, what really got me thinking about all things open. At the time, it was all about open access, and later it became open education. So I was presenting about this Nazi new uh, project. Oh, hold on. Yes. At a, at a conference in Dublin about this new digitization project at the National College of Art and Design, and I was talking about the fact that at the time, a lot of the images from museums were quite expensive to buy. And so it was difficult to incorporate them into our digital library. And I was particularly shocked about that with um, images from Irish museums. And a very well-known librarian at the time who was in the audience during the Q&A session said to me, but why should this museum in Ireland give you their images for free. And I had that kind of light bulb moment. And I said to him, because they can only have those images and those artworks because I'm paying taxes for them to do that. And then it became a kind of expanding awareness of the fact that there were all of these resources that were being paid for by the public that were not accessible to everyone. And that was really, really the start of, of this all things open journey. So the next time I was involved in another digitization project, this time it was an amazingly fun project in the library of Trinity College Dublin, where they had the archive the business archive and the artistic archive of a very well-known stained glass firm in Dublin, the Clark Stained Glass Studios. And this time I had the privilege of working to digitize and catalog this collection and then putting it into the digital repository of Ireland, which is a repository of social sciences and cultural heritage and other kinds of materials, all kinds of data, and all of it is open. So I finally had my wish of making these beautiful images that we were creating and all of these fantastic metadata that was attached to the images completely open in accessible formats and in also machine accessible formats. And for me, this was an absolutely brilliant opportunity because it was working with people who had the knowledge and the understanding of all things open. I got a great introduction to all kinds of Creative Commons licenses and also what open can really mean. So not just open access to scholarship or you know, open ebooks or whatever, but what you can do that somebody else can come and take your stuff and redo, reuse it and remix it and adapt it to their own needs. And to me, that was really exciting. And being involved in a project that was making that possible was just absolutely fantastic. But there was also a kind of missing element to me because this project was mostly about cataloging and digitization. And because of my art history background and my kind of my interest in teaching, I had been teaching at the time um, in some art history courses and also in some of the librarianship master's degrees in, in Dublin. I was very interested in education and I wanted to be in a job that mixed both of those things, librarianship and education. So eventually, I ended up in the job that I'm doing now, which took me from the understanding of open access to something that was more holistic from my point of view, which is 
open education. And I started initially as college liaison librarian at UCD Library, and this, or CLL for short. The CLL position is a teaching librarian position where you are responsible for implementing programs to teach students in your college. In the case, in this case, it was the College of Social Sciences and Law, the principles of information literacy. And we cover everything um, from information literacy to academic integrity, citation and referencing, and everything in between. And because I was in that teaching space, I became very aware of the inequalities of, for instance, the textbook inequality, um, the ebook SOS campaign brought, brought that to the fore, but I was aware of that long before. Um, and also, I was interested in the fact that as a CLL, I was creating online tutorials or at least using some that had been created by my predecessors, but we were sharing very little of it and we weren't reusing other people's materials. So it came to me that we needed a kind of a new approach to our teaching, more involvement with students as uh, co-creators of the materials, and a sort of more awareness of what's happening in, in, in the education landscape in general. So, one of the things that I did as a CLL was a module that was intended to help students acquire research skills. It was called the Research Accelerator module. And it was an online module. It was self-paced. And it was meant to be to prepare students in social science uh, courses to, com to create their research projects in year four of their degree. This is their undergraduate degree. But one of the things that we were really keen on was that there were loads of library resources that students were not aware of that some academics were aware of, but that they weren't really using very well. And we wanted to make them available across the university and if possible beyond so that these materials, which are all Creative Commons library guides and things like that, could be made more accessible. And so we created this module, launched it as a pilot and was really successful. And and it eventually became one of the core modules that could be uh, used in the, in the social sciences undergraduate programs. But the obstacles that we kept coming up, up against time and time again was we were using tutorials that had been created with software that was not open, that was not easily reusable, and it was actually quite difficult to keep updating them. So that again brought me back to this whole area of what are we doing? We're creating stuff. We're not really making reference to stuff that other people have created. Our own stuff isn't being properly shared or even used because people are not aware of what we're doing. So what is the solution to this? And the solution became the role that I'm doing now by way of a couple of things. So during COVID, um, because we were all working from home and a lot of us were attending a lot of online webinars, the Committee of National and University Libraries in Ireland, which is called CONAL, they have a, a kind of professional development um, subgroup. And I proposed to them that we would do an open education webinar and think, present open education as a career path for librarians and have a, a 
proper open discussion about what open educational resources are and what open education can mean for librarians. And we had very prominent speakers with a lot of experience in open education, like Catherine Cronin and people from the US and from Scotland. Amazingly, there was great attendance. And this was really my way of really getting stuck into the concepts of open education and into what I actually wanted to do in my own practice. And then an opportunity came to become UCD Libraries Digital Learning Librarian and launch our Digital Literacy Initiative, which is all around empowering students and staff at UCD to acquire digital skills that they need, not just for their academic work, but for their future professional work in their personal lives, etc. We created a, a digital literacy framework based around these five themes, finding and using information and data, understanding digital identities and practices, creating and communicating digital information, critical thinking and collaboration in digital spaces. And then I set about creating online materials and also outlines for face-to-face -face workshops and, and classes around each of these different um, resources. But for me, the key thing about this role is that it was understood from the beginning that whatever we created was going to be an open educational resource or as close as possible. And I'm sure you know what I mean when I say as close as possible, because sometimes you try your best, but things may not be as accessible as you want them to make them. Um, and also that I would work with students in creating this stuff and that they would help me identify other resources and reuse them and remix them in ways that were relevant for them. So one of the first things that I created is this module called Exploring Your Digital Identity, which is a very, very simple module, just three units, self-based, online, extracurricular, using interactive tutorials and reusing OER whenever possible, or creating new when there wasn't anything there that was suitable for us. So one of the units is a reused OER, the monitoring your online identity, and the other two are ones that we created ourselves. I work with a, a student interns that were absolutely brilliant in contributing their ideas and their knowledge um, to, the, to these module. So this is where I am at the moment. And um, this is our digital literacy library guide, where we have our five hours of openness. And in that page of the library guide are all of the files and all of the outlines and whatever that I'm creating as part of this digital literacy initiative. The files are downloadable. Some of them are actually brand neutral so that people could reuse them in their own VLEs and in their own universities. And this is where I am at the moment. And this is partly why I said that this is a journey. I can't really say exactly that I am a fully grown open educational librarian, but I am heading in that direction doing my best to share everything I have in an open format and learning as much as I can and promoting open education as much as I can. But of course, I also have to say that at the moment in University College Dublin, open education isn't even in the conversation yet. And I'm doing my best to change that as much as I can. <laughs> And that's it. That's where I am. Okay, thank you very much for sharing, for openly sharing your uh, journey on the OER and um, open education in general, because you're, all, you're also um, um, taking uh, the students with you. 
That, yes, uh, and sounds, it really, sounds like a good idea. It's really exciting. We now have funding for a new project um, to do with creating a module on digital skills for professional life. And I'm going to have a minimum of about five students working with me creating the materials. So it's really exciting. Yeah, that sounds uh, very interesting and fun too. Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll keep this in, this in mind. Paola. I think we have a question, yeah. Thank you, Marta. It's amazing to listen to you telling us about your path, uh, moving from Spain and then coming to Ireland. It's, uh, it's incredible. And also, uh, many of the comments you made about your own experience uh, resonate with mine, which is uh, yeah, nice exactly. because I mean, I'm not a librarian. So it's interesting to see how uh, different paths can cross when it comes to open education. Um, there is one thing that interests me uh, most about students. Are students recognized for the work they do uh, with you yes. in projects? I mean, is this recognized as part of their uh, learning path? Do they receive credits? Okay, I'll, I'll tell you, all of them are paid, obviously, uh, because otherwise it couldn't happen. There's no, in, in, in university college, something you cannot have a student working with you if you don't pay them. But also one of the things that I've done is with that module, the exploring your digital identity module, um, I have partnered with the careers office in UCD. The careers office has a scheme which is called the Advantage Award which is a scheme whereby students can submit a portfolio of activities that they have been involved in during their university study, which are not part of their curriculum, but which are personal and professional development opportunities. So they can be volunteering for something or running a student society or doing events or whatever, but, the careers office have recognized our module as one of the activities that their students that the students can submit as part of this portfolio. So what happens is the module has three units and then the students can submit a personal reflection about what they have learned from the module as an assignment. And if they submit this, then they receive a digital certificate of achievement. And they can then submit this certificate towards the Advantage Award. And it's been a really successful partnership in that we launched this as a pilot in March last year. And even though it is a completely voluntary module and there's no credits for it or anything like that, we now have over a hundred students that have completed it. And it's been super interesting for us too, because, because we asked them to reflect what they have learned. We now know what they have learned, what they found that was new, what they already knew, what they liked about the module. And that helps us kind of review the module and introduce new things or reformat it in ways that are more relevant to the students. So it is all a cycle. Yeah, very, very interesting path. And uh, I have just one additional, very short question. How did you motivate them? I mean, they are not getting uh, credits. It's a part of their learning and it's recognized fine. But how do they discover about this opportunity? How they decide to jump oh, in? OK, so that's another interesting one. Um, when I first started working um, as digital learning librarian, there was a project in UCD that was running, it was run by the Irish University Association. And each of the Irish universities had a team working in that project. And it was called the Enhancing Digital Teaching and Learning Project, the EDTL project. And it was all about building capacity in digital skills both among university staff, but also among students. And so I, uh, when I started as digital learning librarian, I was part of that project, which meant that automatically the module 
was piloted with the two colleges in the university that were participating in the project. And so I had the support of lecturers and management in each of the colleges, which meant they were promoting the module to their students. For instance, in the College of Science, they promoted it in a kind of online program space that they have. And because it was coming from the, I think it was the Dean or one of those of science, the students did it. <laughs> and that was something else that was interesting to us because in schools and colleges where it was the lecturers or the vice dean or one of the important people in the college that promoted it, a lot of students took it up. In other places where it was either the library or an administrative unit promoting it, there was less take up. So it was obvious that getting the buying of the lecturers was important. It's still work in progress because it's not, we haven't had across the university involvement of students. There's still more students from the two initial colleges than from the rest. But as, uh, again, it's, it's just identifying champions of digital literacy and creating this conversation and, and, and trying to get lecturers involved. But it is hard work. I imagine that, but thank you for sharing all the, the challenges of this process too. <laughs> thank you, Marta. Lambert. Uh, thank you, Marta. Super interesting. So I'm really uh, that you mentioned a lot of approaches that were new to me. Although in my professional past, I also a little bit uh, work worked in information literacy programs and so on. And it could be in part because I'm my uh, knowledge is not up to date <laughs> because it's, it's a, a while ago, but still it's super interesting. And I was just wondering, uh, I've, it, to me, it feels like that you uh, have certain ways to engage students and so on and to set a um, focus topic on digital identity and related things that are super specific and super interesting and relevant. And I wonder how we can make sure that uh, colleagues from other countries can learn these approaches from each other. I know, I mean, we are here <laughs> and this is all about yes. this uh, kind of- And, and I, actually, this is one of the reasons <laughs> why I agreed to participate in this, because yeah. I think this is a really good, um, yeah. um, you know, dissemination channel and um, I always try to share everything to present at conferences to do recordings to you know to, to try and do it this way the other thing that I am doing at the moment within the university is creating a community of practice around digital literacy and our community of practice is very new I only launched it in February and we're only having our first event in May after the launch, but it's just this kind of tip, 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 tipping away and tipping away at it. You know, the awareness that this is going to be a slow burn, that it is going to take a long time, but that you just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it and keep uh, trying to, to get that focus on digital literacy wherever you can. I mean, I am lucky in UCD in that our current UCD strategy, university strategy, actually mentions digital literacy by name. And it talks about building the, the digital literacy skills of our students and our staff. So every time I do anything to do with digital literacy, all I have to do is say, look, it's in our strategy. <laughs> and already I have a certain level of buy-in. But having said that, it is hard and it's, uh, it's about having a multi-pronged approach. So I've, I'm doing things like applying for internal funding, applying for national funding, applying for international funding as Paola knows, and just making the case for the centrality of the library around this, this topic. 
Uh, one one quick question, uh, Marta, uh, if you allow. Um, what do you think about uh, the status quo in library and information science education? So so so, uh, um, do do you uh, are you in contact about your activities with people who are teaching at university library and information science? Um, what, what what do you think about this? Actually, Paula knows all about this because we are. Uh, I am in, in a, we have just put in an Erasmus Plus proposal with a, a team, with an international team, and I'm working with two, three academics from the School of Information and Communication Studies here at UCD, and also with Paola in Spark, and then we have uh, Croatian partners and Estonian partners, and they're all people who are in library schools in their countries. And they're teaching there so and it's all about building capacity for librarians and not just building digital skills capacity but building the capacity to teach those skills because i think to me and i'm really really passionate about this it's it's the one thing that nobody thinks about when they talk about librarians they never think of librarians as educators but we are because we are in many cases filling in gaps that exist either in academic libraries or in the wider world in public in the public sphere and we come in and are fill, filling those gaps but doing it in a completely under the radar way so i think we need to kind of stand up and be counted and say we are doing this and we are the experts in doing this and fund us for it Thank you. <laughs> wow. Thank you so much. And also for your activism. I love it. <laughs> I think Sylvia has. I can't one help question. it. It's just, it just comes <laughs> with the territory. <laughs> you know. Sylvia has one question. Yeah. Yes, Marta. Thank you for your beautiful presentation and inspiration. Um, if you look back at your whole journey, what do you wish you did different? What can we learn from it? How do you reflect on it? I, I think to me, the, the, the really key thing is that I would have liked to become involved with the whole of open, but certainly with open education earlier, because I think, I mean, now it, we are in a good space there you know we have the unesco declaration and we have all kinds of things but i think there was a lot more that needed to be done earlier that especially around that inequality that exists that not everyone has access to the resources uh, and even inequalities to do with who gets the credit for doing things you know um I think, but also, for me, the, in, the working with the students in the EDTL project last year was a game changer, completely. And I knew intellectually that it, student input was important. But sometimes what happens is that we pay lip service to that, but we don't actually take it seriously. And I can tell you now that module that now has 100 students could never have been that successful or that could never have got that engagement if it wasn't because I had a student working with me who was saying things like, I'll never scroll down to that much amount of text, get rid of it, just do something else with it. You know, it's, it's and their experience of what is like to be a student now in which conditions they study uh, you know like silly things small things like when i design online resources do i think carefully about how they display on mobile no i don't and yet i find from my students that a lot of the study they do is on mobile while they're commuting into college so we need to make these things really beautiful and easily navigable on a mobile. <laughs> Small things like that, but 
I think the student involvement, get involved with students, hear what they have to say, and not just say that you're hearing it, but actually hear it and incorporate it. Yeah, and I understand that you create a lot of materials. How about reusing materials yourself from others? Is that also a scope? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as I said, uh, in, the, in this module, one of three units is a reuse. And yeah. okay, we did have to adapt it because the original was longer, we had less time. And it, had, it was also seven years old, so it needed to be updated. The look needed to be updated. Mm -hmm. But the key concepts and the core text is there. So, yeah, I did, I did hear that it was a topic, but for me it was not clear if re in the material itself, material yeah. from others were also reused to build your module. That was yeah, not yeah, clear yeah. Absolutely. for uh, this question. Yes, thank and, you. And I mean, to me, that is the starting point. Before we start doing research on any kind of new module, that's the starting point. What's out there? Is it usable? Do we need to, re you know, review it or, or uh, update it? But why reinvent the wheel? Yeah. That's yeah, the other thing, that we are not, you know, we are well-paid professionals. We shouldn't be wasting our time reinventing the wheel. Yes, I agree. Yes. And do you have a URL to the environment? Uh, I do, and yeah. I can put it into into the yeah. presentation. Um, as I said, at the moment, it's only a library guide. Eventually, I will get my own web page where I can put all the stuff. Uh, but at the moment, it's just a library guide. Yeah, but that's already a good start. So mm -hmm. thank you so much. Yes. OK, thank you. Are there any more questions? Because maybe we have room for one little bit. Question <laughs> from Paula. If no one else has questions, because I already asked mine, so. Uh, but uh, thank you again, and uh, I I I think that uh, one of the most uh, interesting part of uh, what you shared is related to the teaching skills that librarians are having are having more and more often, and uh, I completely agree. This is hidden in between lines. But uh, as as I can as I see it, it's like being the glue that keeps the pieces together. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So it's really really important that uh, uh, we recognize this openly and give this an official space uh, yeah. to grow. And um, another thing that I find it very interesting is th uh, the feedback that you are listening to from students themselves. Mm. Uh, this is key, I think, because uh, looking at uh, the experience also I have in Polytechnico, when we develop MOOCs, uh, we often share immediately all the video lessons in the YouTube channels, because many students actually follow the lessons from YouTube using their yeah. smartphone, and then they go back to the MOOC just to do the exercises and then the yeah. certificate. Yeah. That's what happens. So that's why we should design the, the, the resources properly. Yeah. and make them reusable also in the best way possible since the very beginning. Because if we de don't design them with the reusers in mind, students and reusers, it, di it becomes difficult to adapt them in the second place. Absolutely. And also we need to live with the, where their study and engagement spaces are. Whether, you know, regardless of whether we like it or not, we have to be where they are. So. I totally agree. Thank you, Marta. Thank you so much for your talk. I think we have a lot uh, to, uh, of stuff to think about again. Great. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, Marta.